My name is Juliana Nicolasian with the Oklahoma State University Library. Also with me today is Tanya Fincham, and we're here in Hugo, Oklahoma. It is Saturday, November 19th, 2011, and we're here interviewing Barbara Bird as part of our uh, oral history of Hugo Circus Occupations Project. Thank you so much for joining us today. You're welcome. Glad to be here. Well, let's begin by learning a little more about you. Could you tell us where you were born, the year you were born? I was born in uh, a little town in Kansas called Smith Center, and I was born uh, July 9th, 1946. And tell me a little bit about your parents. Well, my parents uh, were wonderful people, of course. They were my parents. Uh, I was an only child, so we were particularly close, uh, uh, especially my mother. Uh, they came from uh, uh, varied backgrounds. My mother was a daughter, the last, uh, third youngest child of 11 in a, a farmer's family in, in uh, Kansas. And they had very meager beginnings. They had the typical story of all the kids riding a, uh, an old horse to school and, you know, uh, having hand-me-down clothes and... Um, uh, but they had a wonderful life because of all the siblings, and and she has fond memories. I was uh, close to my grandparents. They used to come and stay with us when we were in our off season back down here in Oklahoma. They would come down from Kansas and and stay with us during the the winter months. So that was a wonderful experience for me, uh, being close to my grandparents. And then of course my grandfather on the other side, he traveled with the circus, so we were always together. But my father. Um, was from a, a family of uh, maybe a little well more well off financially people in in the county. His uh, um, he had teachers in his family, and one of his his grandfather owned the hardware store in the town, and he also owned what was called the Opry House. And traveling shows used to come and perform at the Opera House, and uh, later they converted it to a silent motion picture theater. And uh, during the time when uh, they would be re-reeling the reels of film. Uh, my father and his, uh, my grandfather, would perform on stage with little dogs and ponies and then uh, to entertain the people while the reels were being changed. And then my father would sell popcorn. And that's kind of how they got into circus business. Uh, I'm third generation, so it was my grandfather that really had the interest in the, in the circus. And so they just started fiddling with dogs and ponies and monkeys and typical, I guess you call it a dog and pony show. And uh, they started traveling around Kansas within a 50 mile radius doing little shows and little farming communities. And uh, they just, my grandfather loved the animals and loved the, that part of it. He wasn't like a flashy guy. He was a very uh, quiet, kind of, I'm assuming a small man, but he loved, uh, he loved dogs and he loved ponies and he loved training them. And so they got into it that way, just very gradually. And uh, my father was about eight years old, I believe, when uh, they actually started doing these little shows in the, in the state. His mother passed away shortly thereafter. And uh, he was taken out of school, even though there were school teachers in his family. And my grandfather uh, proceeded on this career of, of circus business. And they worked uh, for other circuses in the beginning. They started a couple of little circuses and failed. And uh, my father also had, I don't want to leave him out because he was very important uh, to the whole scheme of things, uh, an older brother named Kelly. And uh, so it was basically the three of them after their mother died. And they would travel around and work for other circuses. And, and um, they just... He, my grandfather was a very uh, tight fisted with money, and so everything they earned went back into the the box to start their own circus. And like I said, they started a couple and couple of failures. But um, my mother, in the meantime, uh, went through eighth grade, and at that time, it was all in a one room schoolhouse out in the country. So she was going to go on to uh, further her education, but they had to move into the Smith Center to the town, and she was waiting for her sister to graduate from eighth grade so they could go in together and live at a, a boarding house or somewhere and try to continue on with school. But my my mother and uh, father met at a 
a barn dance. And uh, I, I don't know if it was love at first sight, but my mother was said she was very drawn to him. And, and uh, so they married when she was 15 and he was 16. And uh, they'd had their license for oh, several months before they actually got married. And uh, maybe my father tells the story where when they got married, the, the minister charged them, I don't, I don't know the exact figure, but it was $5, something like that. And then he turned around and gave them $3 back as a wedding gift because he could tell they, they were going to need it. And um, so they were married and, and they went with a circus. My mother had never even been out of the county uh, uh, and the first night they stayed in like a pup tent and they stayed on the edge of a, a game farm and she heard these lions growling and train going by and she'd never experienced any of that. And also she ended up with um, uh, chicken pox on her, on, on her wedding night, but I'm sure it was, uh, you know, a very frightening thing for a young girl to be in a pup tent listening to lions and having chicken pox. But uh, they went on and, and they worked for a circus. They, um, uh, she learned to perform and she loved it. And, you know, it, when I came along, it was 12 years later. I, and I, like I said, I'm an only child. So they were, they were married 12 years before I was born. And, uh, but, you know, she loved the circus as much as my dad did and really devoted her life to the circus. And it was his passion, but it grew to be hers. And, uh, she, uh, she she was a wonderful woman. She really was. Well, how did your family come to Hugo? Uh, my family came to Hugo in 1941. And in traveling uh, around the country, there are people in every area of the country that are, are circus fans. They love the circus. They'll go to any circus that comes to the area. But in traveling, they met a man named Vernon Pratt, who was an influential businessman here in Hugo. He owned the big grocery store. In fact, Pratt still have a grocery store in Shawnee, Oklahoma. So they, it was um, a very prominent family, but he loved the circus and he met my parents and my uncle and my grandfather and they became fast friends. And so he, um, my parents had already left uh, Kansas. They moved south gradually looking for a warmer climate as they acquired more animals and uh, uh, they looking for a place for the winters wouldn't be quite as severe as Kansas. So they moved first uh, over to uh, Springfield, Missouri, and then they moved to Joplin, Missouri. Then they came down to uh, Mena, Arkansas. And then Mr. Pratt talked them into coming to Hugo uh, with uh, uh, promise of free water for the animals. So um, for life, you know, that was one of the big draws that, to come to Hugo. So they did come to Hugo. And um, by that time, they had one elephant, and my mother and father lived in the truck, uh, in the front one part of the truck with the elephant, and the elephant lived in the back part. And uh, they parked up as you're going out of town. Uh, if you go through town and on the way to Paris, Texas, there's a corner down there. Um, you know, when you live in town, you don't always remember the names of the streets, but uh, it's still in town, but on the way out towards Paris, there was um, a building there, and I don't know if Mr. Pratt owned it or what, but he let them park there the first winter. So my, the first winter in Hugo, my mom and dad uh, lived in the truck with the elephant. And um, the rest of the equipment, I guess they parked there so they would have um, maybe lights or something for the elephant. I don't know why they got to park by this building, but every the other people were parked out at what they call the poor farm. And again, I as a child, you hear this, but I never said, well, mom, what was the poor farm? You know, I just, but it was a piece of property out there where they let them park. And um, then they bought the uh, farm across the street from where we're sitting today. It was a, an established farm and they bought the acreage. And um, my uh, grandfather, moved into the little house on the on the property and uh, the elephant got a barn and so my mother always joked said that the elephant had a house before she did because uh, she was living still living in a what we would call an RV now but back then it was a uh, very crude type uh, a mobile home and so uh, they uh, they were very fortunate to to find this community because the community has always opened us uh, opened their arms up to us and and we've always felt home at home here 
We didn't always get free water. We pay for our water now. <laughs> but, uh, 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 you know, it's always been a good town. It, it, I was born in 46, so they actually came here before I was born. And the only reason I was born in Kansas was because I was born in the summertime and the circus was touring. So my mother went back to Kansas to, to have me. And then I returned to the circus when I was uh, two weeks old. So that's how we got to Hugo, and we've been here ever since. Uh, I, I, one funny story is my, my father was always a dreamer, and uh, my grandfather and my uncle were more realist and kind of settled, but my father always had big dreams. And so he found a property on further south in Texas one time, and this was probably back in the late 50s, I'd say. And uh, he found a ranch down there for sale that he thought would be perfect for our winter quarters, and he wanted to make one more move further south and it was going to cost $50,000. And, you know, back then that was still a lot of money, but back then that was a fortune. So um, I, I guess they each had equal vote and democracy rule. And probably my grandfather and uncle voted no and my father voted yes. But it turned out that it was um, where the ballpark is and, and Six Flags and, and everything in, in Arlington. That's where it would have been. So we always joked with them that, you know, we, we didn't um, make that next move south. But we've always been happy in here in Hugo. And I think the people of Hugo have really kind of adopted the circus because as you go through the community, you'll see a lot of evidence that the circus uh, is here. Well, what is your earliest circus memory? Mm -hmm. Uh, my earliest circus memory, I wish I was one of those people that could remember the day they were born, but I can't. And sometimes I don't know if I'm really remembering what happened or if I'm remembering the stories that were told about what happened. But really my earliest memories are of riding the pony in the, in the we call it a spec. It's short for spectacular, but it's really the parade that happens during the performance of the circus. And I remember riding the pony uh, in, in the under the tent in the in the circus and I had a little a gold cocker spaniel named Goldie that's original and uh, Goldie used to follow me everywhere and so when I was about um, five years old I learned to do a little it's uh, called swinging ladder and it's the first thing that all the little girls in the circus learn to do and it's basically looks like a, a trellis ladder but it's hung and it has a little loop on it and you swing back and forth and uh, do little poses on it. And my mother was the swinger and my little dog used to come in the ring with us and watch me go back and forth. But, you know, it was, a, it was a wonderful life. And looking back now, I realize how magical it was. But as a child, you take your surroundings for granted. I mean, I, it was a wonderful playground and you got to travel everywhere and be applauded for, you know, doing a silly little trick with your dog, watching you in the center ring. And, and um, it was a great life. I got to be around the animals and, uh, um, you know, I traveled with my mother and father, my grandfather, my uncle, my aunt. And my uncle and aunt had a, a daughter, also an only child, and her name is Karen. She was eight years old, older than me. And so I always looked up to her. And uh, so it was a, it was a magical life. The circus is a, you know, maybe some people wouldn't think so, but the circus is a wonderful place to raise a child. It's a really protective community and uh, uh, everyone's always watching out for the kids. And um, But yet you have this freedom to, to run across the lot. And, you know, there's the horses and the elephants, but there's always a set of eyes watching you and, and uh, very protective of the children. And um, we got to travel. I've been everywhere in the United States and seen probably not every park, but I've been to the majority of the national parks and the wonderful cities of, of the United States. And then, but then you come back to little Hugo in southeastern Oklahoma and you had roots. And that was the great part of my particular um, life in the circus because I had the, I always felt the best of both worlds. I had the roots in the community of Hugo but yet I had this opportunity to travel and do all these exciting things. Some circus children don't have uh, the opportunities I had because I went to the same school system all my life and uh, until I graduated and went on to university. And so some some children don't have that that chance that I had um, in, in circus business. Their parents are uh, artists, performers that 
travel from circus to circus and they don't have that route. But uh, as you talk to circus people in Hugo, I believe that anyone that uh, traveled with the circuses in Hugo felt that sense of having a home because they were always welcomed back to Hugo and felt a part of the community. They didn't feel like the outsider or the weird circus person or, you know, they, they were, the children didn't make fun of them because of their parents' occupation or because they, you know, traveled and didn't have, maybe their home was only on wheels. But uh, the children here were accustomed to that, so they didn't make fun of them. So I think Hugo's been been good for circus. So you would uh, come home attend, and attend school during yes. the school year? Yes. Uh-huh. Okay. Yeah. Yeah. We, uh, I went through school with my, you know, just like any normal child, I've got my first grade picture, my second grade picture, my third grade picture, all with the same uh, children that were my friends that still are my friends here in Hugo. And would your mom come off the road too? Yes. Uh huh. Okay. Yeah. What we did was, uh, as long as the, as you were doing well in school, they would let me leave in March, when my parents went left for the circus to start. And uh, I, my parents always saw to it that I came back when school started. But the teachers would let me take my books, and uh, I still have. Um, letters from the, my student, uh, my friends that were students and where they would write to, to me and send me the letters from um, while I was on the road telling me what, you know, was going on in school and how much they missed me. And, and some of them are our most prominent citizens here, to, you know, now, but I still have the little letters that the teachers would have them write me. And uh, it, it was a, it was a magical, enchanted life I led, you know, Problems of adulthood uh, eventually hit me in the face, but at that time, uh, there was not a care in the world. <laughs> well, you started with Swinging Ladder. Mm -hmm. uh, what are other acts that you may have gravitated towards as you were growing up? Well, I was the owner's daughter, so I usually did anything that, that either no one else wanted to do or that uh, maybe someone broke their leg and, and couldn't do. But uh, I, I always say I was kind of a jack of all trades. I wasn't very good at any of it, but I did it all. So uh, it's a very varied list. I worked with the, uh, I rode the elephants and I rode dressage horses. I worked ponies in the ring. I, I wore a pumpkin head. I mean, uh, anything that, uh, you know, my parents or my father was particularly asking me, I tried to do. I walked tight wire. I did an act called bounding rope where you, um, uh, it was a thick rope and you had a pole and it was kind of like a ballerina type costume and you used to do like different little poses on this rope and you know it sounds silly when you talk about it but it was fun and and I enjoyed it I did uh, um, it was funny I learned to do an act I used to practice every day after school they had a trainer for me in the old barn across the street and so I would practice over there every day after school and um, especially in, in grade school, after I got into junior high, I was a cheerleader and I was in the band and I had a lot of different activities. But in, in grade school, I practiced uh, almost every day and I learned to do a little single trapeze act where you hang by your heels and your toes. And I it was funny, I never got to perform that act because we had a uh, an employee on the circus that was very important to us and his wife learned to work that act. So, um, my parents decide, well, we'll let her perform instead of you. But uh, it was still good training. I, I enjoyed doing it. I did Spanish web, which is kind of a step up from the swinging ladder. All the girls learned to do the Spanish web. And that's uh, just a rope hung. And you do basically the same tricks that you do on the swinging ladder, but it's on a rope and you climb up and, and do the poses on it. And um, let's see, what else did I do? Like I said, I, I kind of did anything that that uh, no one else wanted to do. I, I progressed on to uh, the concession department. I made cotton candy. I, I, um, uh, when I graduated from high school, my, uh, that was about the last year that I performed and my, my parents decided it was time for me to move into the office, that they could hire people to do that, but they needed some family members in the office. So then I, uh, I went into the office. Of course, I'd already started with my grandfather when I was 12 years old. I used to collect tickets on the on the main gate. And um, my grandfather was losing his sight in his older years, but 
it was funny. He could tell a $20 bill from a $5 bill. You know, no one took advantage of him when, when it came to money. But that was a wonderful experience working with my grandfather out on the gate, collecting the tickets from the patrons as they came in. So um, I sold tickets. Um, one year uh, after I was an adult, my our cook quit. And I was already married to my husband then. And so um, we went into the cookhouse and we, we cooked in the cookhouse for about three weeks. And I'm, that's one of the hardest jobs on the circus is trying to make a, a hundred, 200 people happy with their food every day. And, and they're usually not. And uh, it was funny because um, uh, my mother-in-law lived in Lawton, Oklahoma, and there was a, a Motec school over there. So she went and she got two graduates from the culinary school and, and at the Votech Center. And they uh, came up to take over our cookhouse and uh, they arrived on my birthday. So my husband like put bows all over them and brought them up to the cookhouse. And that was my birthday present to get get sprung out of there. But it, it was funny. Uh, uh, I've done everything on the circus, really. Uh, I haven't physically put the tent up and down, but I've uh, uh, helped carry poles or I've, uh, when the wind hits, I've tried to help guy it out so it wouldn't blow over and, and uh, you know, done whatever I could. Well, growing up, did you did you always think that you wanted to be involved with the circus? You know, I I guess I always did. I I knew that I was uh, going to complete my education, and I knew that I I was going to I went I went graduate from OU, uh, but um, I I guess I never made a conscious decision of uh, this is going to be my path in life. I met Gary. Uh, at OU. He's an engineering major. We He had never been to a circus before he met me. Uh, we got married a year after we graduated. He went to Vietnam. And so I came back on the circus with uh, my parents uh, to stay while he was gone. And, you know, I guess I just assumed I would go and do whatever Gary wanted to do. We were going to build roads and bridges or whatever, being a civil engineer. And when he came back from Vietnam, we, um, he was going to go and get his master's and we went back to the campus and this was kind of a tumultuous time, the early seventies. And I don't know, we just didn't seem to fit in. And, um, in the time he was gone, the, the governor had changed and the programs to help the Vietnam vets had changed. And so my, uh, we were just kind of in flux. So my dad said, well, come on, come with the circus, just follow me around for six months and you might like it, you know? And I have uh, I had also determined in that six months that I was gone before he went to Vietnam that I was sad. There was something missing. And I didn't realize it would be like that until I was married and was taken out of this element. Because basically, except for when I was away at school, I'd never been away from the circus. And I guess I didn't think I would miss it as much as I did. But I found that I missed it tremendously. And so when he came back and my dad said that, we decided to just go. He gave, got back in July and it wasn't time to start school anyway. And so we would just at least take one semester for him to decide what he wanted to do. And that was in uh, 1970. Uh, we got married in 70 and that was 71. He was gone. Uh, he left in July of 70 and came back in July of 71. And uh, we've been here ever since. So, uh, he said Vietnam was great training for the circus. <laughs> he learned how to, uh, sleep anywhere, eat anything, and work under very uh, adverse conditions. So he's he's been a great guy to 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 do this, and and he basically loves it now as much as I do. He's devoted his all of his life to it. We'll be married forty two years in January, so he's as much of a pro at it as I am now. Well, after college, and after you all decided you're going to settle with the circus. Mm -hmm. Uh, settle in with the circus. Yeah. Uh, were you more um, involved with business operations at this point? Mm -hmm. Well, actually, uh, I had uh, my first daughter, Tracy, our first daughter, Tracy, uh, in 72. Uh, and then my second daughter came along in 75. And so I was kind of involved in raising them. <laughs> uh, I did uh, I did help. I helped... Um, uh, with the costuming, I helped uh, with the performance direction. 
Uh, I would still fill in anywhere they needed me to sell tickets or whatever. But uh, uh, I didn't really get into the office part of it until um, about 15 years ago where I was in the office on a daily basis. I was more involved with, like I said, the costuming and the, the performance and that, and that time, and raising my girls. <laughs> Can you talk a little bit more about the costuming? Oh, yes. Um, uh, back uh, when we were making it in our basement, uh, we changed themes every year. We would come up with a new theme. And uh, at that time, we probably had, uh, oh, maybe 60 or 70 um, people performers in the circus plus the animals you have to costume also and so it was quite a task we would it was a full-time job we would be in our basement uh, uh, 8 and 9 10 12 hours a day uh, uh, making the costumes we we went from the design to the purchasing the the materials to you know cutting out it went all the way through the process in our basement and um, uh, sometimes it's our harder to fit the the animals and it is the people, it's harder to get them to stand still. But uh, at that time we were carrying with us uh, 18 or 20 elephants. So we made each blanket, you know, each elephant a blanket and they were very detailed. And, and some of our themes were, uh, we had a, a, a Mexican theme and a South American theme. We had a, a, a Knights of the Round Table. We had a Roaring Twenties. We had a Under the Sea. I mean, you just, it just, every year we would have a different theme. And so it, it was a quite uh, time consuming and very expensive uh, thing that we, we did. And then, of course, on the road, there were always repairs and making of, you know, things that got destroyed. The elephant might eat the corner off of one of the blankets or something, or it would get blown off and caught onto a tent stake and get torn. And, you know, there was always repairs to be made. And, um, so it, it was a very uh, all-consuming task making the, the costumes. But, you know, that's that's the dressing, the icing on the cake. If if they went in there in their street clothes, it wouldn't be very pretty. So uh, I think it's a very important part of the circus. And we carry the tradition on till today. We, we are constantly making new costumes. We don't have quite as many performers as we used to. We've condensed it down uh, to a run-ring circus. And um, I often wonder what my dad would think of that because, like I said, he was a dreamer and he always wanted the tent so big that you couldn't see from one end to the other. And he accomplished that. And uh, But with today's economic times and with the rules and regulations, government oversight and, you know, just the complicated world we live in today, we, we have downsides, but we have a wonderful product and we get rave reviews everywhere we go. So I'm hoping that yeah, it would only be my father that would be critical, not not the public. My, uh, I was kind of sad one time. I was sitting in the tent, and we had uh, actually gone from a five ring circus down to three. So we hadn't even gone to the one ring yet. And I was sitting in there, kind of melancholy. It was the night before we were going to open, and the lights were very dim. And I was sitting in the seats, and in walk uh, uh, David Rawls's father, Harry Rawls, who I I hope you have were able to speak to before he passed away. And um, he walked in and he said, what's the matter, Barbara? We were setting up over at Paris and he'd come over to check out the operation. And I said, oh, I was just feeling kind of sad, Harry. I was wondering what my father would think of cutting down to three rings. And he said, well, I'm going to tell you one thing, Barbara. He said, your father's probably mad at you, but he said, your grandfather is so proud because my grandfather never wanted to have that big colossus of a circus. He wanted to have the smaller, more intimate family, you know, experience type circus. So uh, I f it made me feel better uh, that uh, he thought my granddad would be okay with the idea. But I know that my father would be happy that the show is still continuing. He wouldn't care what form it was in. And when he says he would be mad at me, he really wouldn't be mad at me. He would just be so proud that we're, forging on that no matter what it takes, we're going to keep this operation going. And it has to be one ring, it has to be 30 or 40 performers, it has to be three or five elephants instead of, that's okay, because it's still continuing the tradition, keeping the circus going. 
backing up just a little bit, mm -hmm. I think um, the two circuses that I associate with your family, mm -hmm. Algie Kelly Miller yes. and Carson Barnes. Right. Can you talk a little bit about Algie Kelly Miller? Yes. Uh, when I talked about my childhood and of growing up and how wonderful it was, that was on Algie Kelly and Miller Brothers. Miller is my maiden name. Uh, they used to be called um, Miller Brothers Circus. And as most people in Oklahoma knows, there was a famous Miller's uh, 101. Uh, and so it was kind of a confusion there. We used to even get some of their mail. I don't know whether they got any of ours or not, but we used to. And uh, as we went along, they thought they needed to differentiate the name a little more. And so there was a famous traveling circus back in the probably 20s, 30s called Algie Barn Circus. And that kind of had a ring. They liked that. So they kind of pilfered the Algie and they put the Kelly on because that was my uh, uncle's first name. So they, they called it Algie Kelly and Miller Brothers Circus. And it was um, uh, in business. That was the one they actually formed in, in 1937. And uh, it was in business and, until the mid-60s, uh, late 60s. And my father, uh, he went through some downtime because uh, uh, my uncle died at a very young age. He was only 46 years old when he passed away. And then my grandfather died in um, 1969, 70, uh, 70, 69, I'm sorry, I was married in 70. And uh, I think my dad went through kind of a really hard time for him because his mentor and his brother were gone and he didn't really know if he was capable or able or even wanted to try to keep going. And so he had, um, he had started, I don't know how many circuses in his lifetime, uh, lots of them right down in Hugo. There was a uh, famous Cole and there was Tex Carson. There were several different shows that he had started. And he had started uh, Carson and Barnes Circus with a gentleman named Jack Moore and his family. And uh, so it was in operation. It was founded in the 50s. And it was operating simultaneously with Algie Kelly and Mellow Brothers Circus. We were, didn't travel with it, but my father had financed it, and uh, Mr. Moore was running and operating it with his family. So uh, as Algie, Kelly, and Miller Brothers kind of uh, took a back seat, uh, it actually went off the road for uh, a while. And uh, then in the, uh, see, he had it about 25 years. Sometimes my dates aren't. But David Rawls was a young man that worked for us. And uh, he came from a long history of circus families. And he's ambitious and, and he had, was running our concession department. And my husband and he are about the same age and, and they were friends and they often discussed that David would like to, um, not didn't wanna do this his whole life. He wanted to be a circus owner and manager. And so my husband put the bug in my dad's ear that David would probably be leaving if we didn't do something with him to, to hang on to him. And so my father bought an old defunct circus and uh, uh, they, uh, David put the elbow grease in it. My dad put the, some of the finances behind it and they, they started, uh, they took it back out and that would have been about 30 years ago. So uh, I have to do the math there. And uh, David ran it successfully for 25 years. Uh, before he uh, decided to retire. And uh, he wasn't out of it for about six months. Then uh, John Ringling North came along, who's a descendant of uh, uh, the famous Ringling family. And I think he wanted a hobby. And so he uh, bought uh, the circus. By this time, the name had been shortened down to uh, legally to just Kelly Miller Circus. David thought the Algae Kelly and Miller Brothers was a little wordy. So he condensed it down to just the current title of Kelly Miller Circus. And um, how we ended up on Carson and Barnes was during this kind of downtime for my father, uh, Mr. Moore developed cancer and his wife asked us if we would come over and kind of help. And so we went over, I worked in the office, we ran the concessions and my father was just kind of there to support him. And um, he did pass away and, and didn't want to continue. So my father bought her 50% of the operation and we were right back 
in the middle of circus business again. So there was, um, it, I called Carson and Barnes, Algie Kelly Miller Brothers, and everybody did for, for a long, long time until we finally got it into our heads uh, that we were on another circus with another title. But my father built that circus from a very small operation into the, the largest traveling circus in the United States. And that's when we had the five rings of uh, the, you know, a lot of elephants, a lot of animals, um, a lot of people. And at one time we had almost 250 people that were traveling and uh, uh, moving every day to a different location. It was a huge undertaking. The logistics. Oh, it's it's was it was mind boggling. You know, the the army, uh, the uh, I don't know if it was the army or, or which branch, of, but the armed services actually went and studied uh, Ringling Brothers when they were under tent uh, to to see how they did what they did because, you know, they moved, uh, you know, Ringling Brothers in, in its heyday under the tent had 2,000 employees and they had 500 horses and they traveled by train, but they they moved this huge colossus thing in a very orderly and organized manner. And we get tickled, really, when we hear, I think the media in this day and age kind of uses circus in a negative light. And it really drives me crazy because they'll, uh, you know, the OJ trial or the whatever, it's a circus, it's a circus. And, and if they only knew how organized and orderly a circus is, they wouldn't even think about using that in the, in the terms that they're using it today because there's nothing chaotic or, or disorderly or unorganized about the movement of a circus. It's very it's um, very coordinated and it's time driven and uh, everyone knows their job. And when you come to see our circus set up, you won't see any screaming or hollering or it, everybody knows their job. They do their job and um, it, they people ask me, how do you get them to move so fast and to to do that job so well? And I said, well, they they get uh, a salary. They don't get paid by the hour when they're finished. They're they're off and when you know so they they kind of keep moving along but it, it's not a negative word circus is is a positive word and it's brought joy and in entertainment and to millions and millions of people all over the world for centuries and and so it should be seen in a positive light and uh, it kind of ruffles me every time I hear the media use it in that manner but um, I kind of got off track I'm not sure we were headed but <laughs> Um, you know, you, you talked about your father being a, a big dreamer. Mm -hmm. Um, and I think something else that the circus industry associates your family with are elephants. Oh, absolutely. Could you talk a little bit about, about that? I mean, did yeah. you just wake up one day and say, I think we need a whole lot of elephants? Well, he loved elephants. And like I say, when my parents moved to town, my mother lived in the truck with the elephant. The, the elephants came first, and it had a home before my mother had a home. And uh, they just have always loved elephants, especially my father, uh, more so, I'd say, than my uncle and my grandfather. And so he, he wanted to have more elephants than anyone. I mean, that was his big dream. And at one time, he did have 50 elephants. And so uh, uh, he's always been associated with the elephants, uh, all of his life, he loved to uh, work with them and train them. When I was a baby, my mother tells stories about how they would go on the off season and they would take their elephants. Uh, they made a Tarzan movie in Hollywood one time, uh, which is always hysterical because I think Tarzan was in Africa and these were Asian elephants, but you know, no one paid any attention. And um, they would go and make like the big shrine dates in the Colosseums and during the winter time and and uh, they they performed with elephants since before I was born. And my mother tells the story. Like I said, she was a little farm girl from Kansas, never even seen an elephant. And so they, when they finally got their first elephant, my dad was so proud, and he brings this elephant in. And uh, so my mother's gonna style the act for him, you know, be the the beauty uh, in there with the the big pondering uh, elephant. And so my dad says, "Lay down," and um, he was kind of a jokester anyway, and lay down. So she laid down. So he brings this elephant and this elephant is going to step over her. And so the first thing she did was got up and ran, of course, but it did uh, uh, 
go into the act and eventually the elephant did step over and lie down and she did all the mounts and everything but they just always loved elephants and 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 uh when they passed away they actually left their estate directly to the elephants and they had already given uh property to the elephants to the endangered art foundation 120 acres and um, so we used their estate to uh, erect the buildings that house the elephants and the exercise pens and uh, and we have a, some left in a fund for perpetual care of the elephants. They, it was very important to them that uh, they felt they were part of our family and that they stay together um, and we care for them till they pass on. So um, that was an important part. And he also set up the, the breeding program and and uh, wanted there to be baby elephants around us. And, and he wanted there always to be elephants in the United States because it is predicted if at one time, and maybe still is, that if the birth rate didn't change, that by the year uh, 2050, they would be extinct in the United States. And uh, so we're, we have the second largest gene pool of uh, Asian elephants in the United States next to Ringling Brothers. And so we're a very vital part of trying to see that the Asian elephant doesn't disappear from the United States. We don't have much control on the rest of the world, but uh, uh, hopefully we can keep them coming here. And in the early days, they were named after? Oh, yes. They're still named after members of our family. That's a, a very important thing if you get an elephant named after you. Our our, lace, our latest baby, uh, as you may well know, was born in April, and it was a little boy, and he he got the, the town got the honor of having him named after Hugo. But uh, before that, we had a little girl, and she was named Val after my mother-in-law, Valene. And we have a Tracy and we have a Christy and we, you know, have uh, a Lisa and uh, Libby was my, my grandmother. And at one time in the 70s, my father got 12 elephants at one time. And so they were named, uh, seven of them were named after my mother's sisters and her. So um, uh, they, I, I actually have a picture of them, the elephants when they were small with each aunt that was their namesake. So that's a treasure because they've all passed on now. And uh, they got a big kick out of it if, like, Isa's had a, a couple of babies. Well, my real aunt, Isa, uh, never had children. And so she got a, a big thrill out of her elephant, Isa, being pregnant and, and having babies. But uh, no elephants. Uh, as you look around my home, I'm, I have elephants everywhere. So elephants have always been a very important part of our lives. How, how, how long has the oldest one with the family. Okay. We lost, uh, uh, my namesake was Barbara, and uh, we lost her uh, two summers ago. She was 68 years old. And so our oldest elephant now is probably Minnie. Minnie and Susie are almost the same age. But um, I performed with Minnie uh, in the ring when I was about 12 years old, and she was probably about five years old. And uh, I'm 65 now, so uh, she's getting on up there. But she's semi-retired. She only does just a little bit of traveling, not much at all. And uh, she will be retired soon. But, you know, the elephants, uh, they're kind of creatures of habit. And, and they've been doing this all their lives. They ride along with us. They've been moving and performing. And, and they know when it's time to to get in the truck and go to the next town. And they, when they get to the next town, they put their trunks up in the air and they kind of smell around and try to see, well, what's this new town going to offer, you know? And I think they're kind of like people, uh, sometimes uh, people when they retire, they think it's going to be wonderful, but it really isn't. And, uh, and uh, so I think elephants are kind of like that. I think as long as they're healthy, and uh, they're not in any pain or they should keep performing. They keep their muscles toned and, and that's what their life has been. So, and I'm not retired yet. So <laughs> many, many will keep going for a little while. <laughs> so they live to be 75-ish? Well, they live to be in their, their mid-60s, late 60s. Uh, we have never had any that have reached 70, but hopefully we will someday. Well, I, I kind of want to get into... You as a, the owner-operator mm -hmm. of Carson and Barnes, but uh, I do want to step back uh, and talk about uh, when your father passed away. Mm -hmm. And uh, did he pass away on the road? Yes, my father passed away in, in McCook, Nebraska. And uh, it was about 
about time for the circus to start, the afternoon performance. And uh, he had a motorhome. My mother had already passed away. My mother passed away 11 months before my father did. And they were almost married 65 years, I believe it was. And, um, uh, you know, as a child, you maybe I everyone doesn't, but I often wondered if with, which my parents would do better if, if one of them passed away, which one would would do better. And and uh, I think it would have been my mother uh, because my father, like I said, only lasted 11 months. And um, he uh, he was visiting the show after my uh, mother had passed away. He came on and he fell and broke his hip. And so that was kind of the start of the of the bad stuff. It wasn't so much the hip. He, he passed away from his heart. He had a heart attack, but uh, he had a rough go with the hip and, and uh, he's a very proud man and he used to drive himself to this physical uh, therapy in Paris. You know, he wouldn't let anybody else drive him. So he'd put the walker in and he'd drive over to do his physical therapy. And, and I think maybe he felt like he was going to be limited and he kind of went downhill, but he did pass away in, in McCook, Nebraska, and he passed away while his circus was touring. Uh, I didn't realize it at the time. He uh, went over, he drove over that morning. Actually, my youngest daughter, Kristen, drove his motorhome over and he was riding with her and he was, he had a, a heart attack. And uh, so he, they had taken him to the hospital in McCook before I even got there. So as soon as I got there, they started motioning me. I could tell something was wrong and I didn't even park my trailer. I just jumped out and got in a car and they took me down to the hospital. But he was doing better when I got there and and uh, they were going to release him. And so they told us to bring him back at nine o'clock in the morning. And uh, I have a little hard feelings for the hospital there because he never actually saw a doctor. He saw a physician's assistant. And um, he was an uh, 83-year-old man that had come in with a obvious heart attack. And he didn't really, I said if he'd been the mayor in the town, they'd probably air flow, uh, flight it into Lincoln. But he was just the circus guy coming through town. So they sent him home and told him to come back at 9 o'clock in the morning. And they would look at him. Well, he died at 4 o'clock that afternoon. And uh, he died in his motorhome on the circus grounds, which was probably preferable to him anyway. But... Um, when we picked him up at the hospital and uh, we were talking and asking how it felt, of course, and my husband and I and, and our two daughters were in the car with him and we were driving back to the fairgrounds where the circus was set up. He said that, uh, and I'd never heard this story, he said that this was the first town he had ever seen a circus in. And then when he was a little boy, his father and mother had brought he and his brother Kelly from uh the Smith Center area of Kansas up to McCook, Nebraska to see a circus. It was called the John Robinson Circus. And I later had someone look it up and it would have been in 1924. And uh, they had records of the circus being in there. So uh, he told us about his experience of coming and seeing his first circus. And uh, we got back to the um, to the fairgrounds and of course like I said it was just about time for the band to strike up for the 430 show and and he died in his motorhome but it was really um it was almost like it was full circle and the weight that that story took off of my shoulders I can't even describe to you how it felt to have, if I'd never heard that story I think I would have been you know completely devastated, but there was something about that story that he had come full circle from that little boy seeing his first circus to this famous circus owner, you know, seeing his last circus. So it was, it was a very moving uh, experience. So for me and for, for my family. And uh, he had basically planned his own funeral. He had already purchased his coffin. It was a shiny red coffin with brassy gold trim. And, um, uh, he always said, you can get a lot of publicity out of this for the circus. So um, we did. We got a lot of publicity off, off of it. But um, he didn't want to be buried uh, while his circus was touring. He wanted to be buried when after his circus came home. So it was, it was all so strange because we, ha we were in McCook, Nebraska, but we were heading to Colorado. The only people in the world, besides the people here in Hugo that I know that own a funeral home, happened to be in Denver, Colorado. 
they're relatives of relatives. And so we called them and uh, they said, you know, we'll come get him. So we actually, we actually, they picked him up in McCook. We um, had a couple of moves in between. We ended up in Littleton, Colorado over the weekend. They had already gotten my father. We went down that morning uh, before we left McCook, my my husband and our two daughters, and we picked out a very uh, plain wooden casket for him to be transported in because we knew he had this shiny one back home. And uh, they they came and picked him up. They took him to uh, Littleton, to Denver, and they prepared him for um, a funeral. And uh, we had two shows in Littleton, but we had a, a, a service in the tent between shows. And uh, uh, it was a wonderful service. Um, we, we gave our show. We had full capacity people, which my father would have loved. And we ran them out and we all came in and uh, he was brought into the tent by um, a, a, a young male elephant pulled in on a wagon uh, and he, he was placed on uh, uh, elephant tubs, which are the big tubs that the elephants perform on in the ring. His casket was placed there. We had some flowers. We had music over the sound system. At, at that time, we actually had some uh, Catholic nuns that traveled with us. We're not Catholic, but the majority of our employees were. So we had a, uh, some Catholic nuns that were uh, have done this for 40 or 50 years, traveled with circuses, and they happened to be traveling with us at that time. So they uh, helped greatly with the service. We, uh, Our minister from Hugo flew in and some... Uh, uh, Friends flew in from all over, and we actually had a service right there in between the shows uh, on the on the circus, and uh, um, just like I think he would have enjoyed it. Uh, but he didn't, like I said, want to be buried while his circus was on tour. So um, our friends in Denver took him back to their mortuary, and they they put him on cold storage until. Uh, uh, the circus tour was over in November, and then when we came home, we had um, the one that got us all the publicity. <laughs> the one, the one in Littleton, Colorado, was very quiet and private, but the one that we had in Hugo was uh, covered uh, around the world. I received clippings from around the world from newspapers, and it was covered quite heavily here in in uh, in Oklahoma. The Tulsa, it was on the front page of the Tulsa World, of the the Daily Oklahoma, and um, of course our paper here in town and and the Paris paper and and uh, it was a glorious day in the fall and I think everything went just like he would have planned it he uh, David Rawls and uh, Trey Keys actually helped us quite a lot because it it took place just two days or three days after we came home and so I wouldn't have had time to coordinate everything so they set the Kelly Miller tent up out at the fairgrounds we put the seats in it. We set the rings up, the lighting. Uh, again, he was placed on uh, uh, the elephant tubs in the center ring. And uh, uh, circus owners from all over the United States flew in. They were his pallbearers. And um, it was a, all the townspeople came out. And it was a, a, a really a celebration of his life and of his love of the circus. Um, uh, very moving. Uh, uh, many people. We had representatives from the community that spoke. We had representatives from the circus world that spoke. My daughter composed a poem. Um, uh, our minister again conducted the uh, the services, and uh, from the fairgrounds um, we had a parade. We paraded to the cemetery, and uh, we even have a video. Someone produced a video of it, and. Uh, they closed the schools, uh, the businesses closed down, and there were hundreds and hundreds of people that uh, stood on the on the sidewalk and, and for the procession to the cemetery. And uh, we made it a circus parade. We had uh, camels and elephants and horses, and uh, uh, Mr. Rawls and, and Mr. Keys had uh, arranged to have a a uh, circus band there, and they brought circus wagons in from historical museums um, from Peru, Indiana, and different places. And uh, we had a circus band up on top of the uh, the parade wagon. He was in a, uh, a horse-drawn hearse, and my father was. Uh, we had um, uh, 
the elephants were decked out in their best blankets and uh, the lead elephant actually carried his uh, uh, flowers that were placed on his uh, coffin. Um, uh, that he, they carried it to the to the cemetery, and when we got there, the band played. And uh, he had a, of course, he served in World War II. He was uh, served in Europe, and uh, so he had a, um, you know, he had the military burial also. But it was quite an affair. And uh, uh, as we went along the city streets, people held up signs uh, thanking him for all the fun memories of the circus and the good times. And it was quite, quite, um, quite moving. <laughs> the way he would have wanted it. Yes, exactly the way he would have wanted it. Uh, he, he got a lot of uh, publicity and, it, and he brought, even in his death, he brought a lot of smiles to, there were clowns in the parade. And so uh, it was, it was a great day. What do you think your mother would have thought? Oh, she would have been, you know, she was that, um, uh, the song, Bette Midler's song, The Wind Beneath Your Wings. Well, she was, she was that to him. And uh, she was the rock in the family. And um, she always took second place behind him, but she was really holding him up. And uh, she was a wonderful lady and uh, the, one of the strongest people I ever knew or ever will know. Well, at this point, um, I guess there was uh, no doubt in your mind that the circus was going to continue. Well, pretty much so. Uh, he he kind of said it had to, So, and everyone usually listened to him. But um, he also g gave other sage advice. Uh, he said, uh, it can break you, so don't let it break you. And uh, um, so that's one reason we've tried to cut down is because we want to keep it going. But, you know... It's it's very very costly in these day and age to keep keep it going. So that's one reason why we've uh, made it smaller is to try to keep it going. Um, but he would be happy. He he would be happy with our with our attempt, and he would be very proud of. He never got to know his uh, uh, great grandchildren, but uh, he helped graze his his granddaughters, and he would be very proud of them today and of me and my husband. Well, let's talk a little bit here in Hugo uh, at the Mount Olivet Cemetery. We have Showman's Rest. Can mm -hmm. you talk a little bit about how all of that got started? Sure. Uh, we had a gentleman that worked for us and he was just a drifter that came on as a teenager and ended up spending his whole life with us. His name was uh, John Carroll and he worked with the animals and uh, Especially back in the old days, uh, some of the guys that would come along, they they were drifters and didn't really have family connections. And so the circus kind of ended up being their family and their home, and uh, they spent their lives here. So John Carroll was one of those characters, and uh, he had uh, lost his eye in, a, in an accident, and he received a like an insurance uh, settlement, I think it was $17,000 or something. And um, he didn't have a family, so he, about five or six years later, he passed away. And unbeknownst to my father, he had left this insurance settlement to my father. Uh, and uh, so my dad didn't know what to do with it. And about that same time, my uncle passed away, and that was in 1960. And so he... Um, uh, got the idea of making this place where uh, circus people would be buried and uh, it would be someplace, because a lot of times circus people, like I say, don't have roots and they would be buried in Timbuktu and nobody would ever know who they were or know this rich history that they had or anything about them. So he thought it would be cool to have this area where circus people could be buried and that there would always be somebody that would come and visit that would be able to tell stories about that person or know have a connection to uh, their family or it was just going to be a, a place where they wouldn't be forgotten so um, when my uncle died he purchased he took this John Carroll money and he purchased um, this area at at Mount Olivet, and he named it Showman's Rest. My uncle was the first person uh, buried there, and uh, um, 
so my father buried John Carroll there. He has one of the biggest headstones out there. I don't know if you've been there or not, but his is quite large. And then my father had what was left. He he uh, put it in a uh, he invested it, and uh, so that it would always be earning money. And he had it fixed so that if somebody died in circus business and wanted to be buried there, if they didn't have the means or the family, that John Carroll's fund would supply the plot and put a small marker. And if you'll notice when you're at the cemetery, there'll be some small markers that say donated by the John Carroll Fund. And so uh, it's worked quite well. We're almost full. We only have just a few plots left and we're trying to figure out how we can expand. But that was the basis of it, of how it got started. It was a, an inheritance from one of our workers that uh, didn't have family and left the money to my father. And my father had this vision of a place that uh, would be like it is today. And so uh, it's really become a landmark in Hugo. And uh, I'm always amazed. I go out to change the flowers on my parents' uh, and my grandfather and step-grandmother's uh, graves oh, four times a year or something. And I'm always amazed when I'm there that it never fails that at least one group will stop by, maybe just a couple or maybe a bus tour will stop by to be looking at this particular part of this uh, community uh, cemetery. So it has uh, gotten quite a bit of notoriety around at least the state and, and it was in Southern Living Magazine one time and it's gotten some national publicity. So it's a uh, kind of a tourist place in Hugo and you always feel kind of silly asking people, well, you've been to the library, you've been to the museum, you've been here, you've been there. Have you been to the cemetery yet? And they kind of give you a funny look, but it's a a, a really neat place. And it, um, I don't know, it, it kind of gives you a sense of well-being when you're there to know that uh, these people will never be forgotten. And a lot of people who are buried there have been so closely tied to the circuses in Hugo, and not only just yeah. Hugo. Oh, absolutely. The majority are, uh, you know, there's our circus mechanic, and there's our trapeze star, and there's, you know, just all these different people there that have lived in Hugo and are known in the community, but there's also people buried there that just wanted to be where other circus people are buried which, you know, it's, it may sound corny, but that's, that was their desire. So there are people there uh, from California. There's a young man that was killed in a, a train accident with Ringling Brothers who never worked for our circuses in Hugo or never lived in Hugo, but he wanted to be buried there. And so there are a number of people there that really have brought, have requested to come from many different parts of the United States to be buried there. You said your uncle was the first one. That yes. Mm -hmm. Did your father design the stone? Uh, I, you know, honestly, I don't know. My aunt was still living at that time. And I don't know whether my father, um, unfortunately, she's passed on and so is her daughter. And her, uh, his, uh, her grandson still lives in here in Hugo, but I don't really know who designed. Uh, it was uh, put up by... Uh, Griffin Monument Company out of Ada, Oklahoma, and they've done a lot of the the stones there, the the wonderful wagon wheel and 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 ones that are very unique. But I do know that they did take a picture of the archway in front, and it was done uh, stone by stone, an exact replica of what the archway. Uh, is it's still there? And so uh, my aunt and uncle built this home. And it was built in the mid '50s, and uh, for this part of Oklahoma at that time, it was, you know, quite a place, and still is. But I can remember um, they, my aunt and uncle, didn't live here very long because my uncle passed away, and my aunt just didn't uh, want to continue living here. It's a large home, and her daughter was um, at the University of Oklahoma at that time. She started at OSU. She was in the band at OSU, but uh, <laughs> she ended actually ended her studies at um, uh, in Oklahoma City, but she did attend OU. And, and so my aunt moved up to Midwest City to be closer to her and her grandson. And, and uh, so she wanted to sell the house and um, my father bought it from her. I moved in here when I was 14. And so I've lived here ever since. But it was it uh, quite a house, and people used to just pull up and ring the doorbell and say, we've heard about this house. Can we look at it? And my father would just bring them in and show them around. It was a very 
we're talking the early 60s, and, and it was very trusting uh, at that time. You wouldn't necessarily do it now, but um, I remember him being very proud of it and the fact that his brother had built it. My uncle did a lot of the woodworking in the shop in the back, making the cabinets and the windows and stuff. So I would hear my father giving his 50 cent tour and I'd be a teenager in my bedroom throwing my clothes in the closet, trying to get my room straightened up before the, uh, the people walked in. But uh, it's uh, our home has been a, um, a very important part of our life because um, it, you know, we came back here every year and, Every year we'd come back, we would always have uh, well, my grandfather's birthday party or a New Year's party or whatever, and we would invite the circus people from the community. And um, it, it's always been kind of a gathering place. Many, many, many baby showers and and different events have taken here, taken place here. And we still have the occasional person that wants to go through and see it because it does have some very unique aspects. Well, I think you're. Your family is also known for innovations mm -hmm. in, in circus uh, through the years. Absolutely. Um, could you talk a, a little bit about uh, some of them? Well, my my family uh, started many businesses here in Hugo because they started uh, a printing company. And so we did would do our own posters and printing uh, of our items. We had that for a while. We They started a uh, welding shop. Uh, with uh, Wayne Sanguine, and uh, my uncle was uh, a very uh, creative guy, and, and he was uh, a lot of the force behind some of the mechanical innovations that took place on the circus. Uh, actually, he, they invented and held patents on several different uh, tr circus paraphernalia. One was called a, uh, a tent, a spool, and uh, they named it a spool because it uh, basically is a giant like a giant spool of thread, but instead of winding thread, it wound the big top. And so at night when the boys would take the tent down, instead of having to physically hoist it up onto a, a semi or a flatbed, they would uh, unlace it uh, in the middle and they would fold it, fold it, fold it till it was less than eight feet wide. They would hook it onto this spool. And as the truck backed up, this spool would actually turn and pull this canvas up on it. So it was divided into two parts to distribute the weight. And then also it, the tents were so large that it couldn't go on one. It would be top heavy. But uh, they actually perfected that here and patented it. They also were very innovative in developing um, pile, call it pile driver. We call it a stake driver because we call the 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 post or, or uh, rod irons that are in the ground. We call them stakes, uh, S-T-A-K-E-S. And uh, uh, they had different techniques to drive these. And of course, in the old days, it was uh, arm power. It was five or six guys standing around slinging these sledgehammers to, to put these down. But as the tents got larger and there were more stakes to be put in the ground on a daily basis, I think most people think, well, the circus sets up and you sit there for, no, we move every day to a different town. So the stakes had to be driven in the morning and pulled up at night. So they developed different uh, systems to uh, drive these stakes uh, um, mounted on either tractors or the back of uh, trucks. And it, it eased up the the physical labor a lot. And, and as labor got more expensive back, you know, during the 30s and 40s, you could pay somebody a dollar a day and give them a place to sleep and food and they were happy. But as times progress and, and minimum wage and, and demands increased, uh, we could afford fewer workers. So now all the stakes, I say all the stakes, that's not true. We still drive some stakes the old fashioned way. Number one, the public loves to watch it. Five or six guys in coordination, you know, driving these stakes. Uh, I still like to watch it, but also, uh, you know, for the smaller tents and for areas where you can't maneuver the, the tractor or the truck, we still send the guys out to, to drive the stakes, but it's much faster and requires a lot less help. So they developed the, the stake driver. Uh, we were the first circus in America to carry a giraffe in a truck. And uh, my father designed a semi truck that uh, was especially designed for the for the giraffe. Um, 
we uh, make all our own like uh, elephant trucks. Uh, you don't just go out to your local trailer store and buy a, 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 an elephant semi. So they all have to be specially reinforced and designed, you know, air openings in the floor and everything to, to haul the, the elephants. Um, they've done a, a, a lot of innovative thing as far as seats, uh, seat wagons. In the old days, the seats were put, they were called stringers and, and uh boards and they would put a the stringer was the part that went up and then they would have a a frame uh thing that held them up and then the boards would fit on them and they'd tie them on with binding twine it was very con time consuming to erect these uh and honestly they weren't quite as safe probably as they should have been because some of the grounds on level or if there was mud and they would have to put boards under them to try to level them up and and uh, so um my father was very uh, involved in developing the uh, modern seat wagons that uh, uh, actually fold out. We call one of ours, uh, newer ones, we call it a transformer because the kids have the transformer toys. And so that it kind of transforms into a, a vehicle going down the road that hauls equipment, poles, ring curbs, uh, different uh, lighting and things. And it and when it gets there, that all gets unloaded and it transforms into this seating grandstand. So they were very uh, uh, inventive in that matter. My father was uh, uh, way ahead of his time in many things. He uh, was the first one to use uh, airplanes as advertising. Uh, he had a small um, single engine plane that traveled in front of the circus. And back in those days, you could do about whatever you wanted to in the air. So it, uh, the pilot would fly over the town with a loudspeaker and circus music and uh, tell about the circus coming to town. Uh, uh, there's just many, many examples like that of things that they, they did that were innovative and uh, kind of ahead of their time. It kind of leads us into how the circus has changed from yesterday mm -hmm. to today. Um, maybe we can hit on a couple of okay. those things. Um, I guess today music is probably canned. It is, I'm sorry to say. That's one of the true regrets I have because I love the circus band. They used to hit some awful notes <laughs> and be out of tune, but to me, you know, that was all part of it. I, I love the circus band. When we first got started, I wasn't around, but, you know, I have memories even when I came that uh, we had um, usually like an organ and a trumpet and a drum. That was all we could afford. But in the very beginning, my aunt was a talented musician. So my mother leaned more towards uh, performing in the circus, but my aunt uh, usually supplied the music. And so she um, always played the organ. And uh, we usually have a, a drummer that was keeping beat over there. He might not be a real drummer, but somebody could hold some sticks and kind of stay with the music. And so my, my aunt always supplied the music. And I think music is very important to a circus. And um, proof of that, I think, would be uh, the modern example of the Cirque du Soleil because they have, don't get me wrong, they have wonderful artists, but the majority of their appeal is their smoke and mirrors and their music. Their, you know, the illusion and, the, and, and, and what they, you know, that some of the acts came straight from Carson and Barnes or straight from other circuses. So it's how it's presented. So I think music and the staging is very important. And and um, I love those old timey bands. We at one time had a 11 piece band and uh, we would have the organ, the drums, a couple of trombones, trumpets, a, a bass and and it was a, really an oompa pa type thing. And, and like you imagine the ta-da at the end of the act and everything. And uh, it just, uh, we only changed to uh, tape music. Uh, we were one of the last ones to go to it. We held on to the very end. But again, it's hard to find uh, musicians that want to travel on our schedule. We get tickled when we hear the rock people and the country people say, oh, we have, you know, 30 days on, we're doing 15 spots over three months or whatever, you know, they're just all this time. We do, we show in a different town every day, two to three shows a day for eight and a half months. So I don't want, you know, I don't accept their belly aching when they're traveling in these multi-million dollar buses and they arrive and it's all set up and they, but uh, it's hard to get musicians that want to, to live under those. And, you know, the, um, 
those circumstances. And with uh, you, also union uh, had an effect on, on bands, circus bands, because, um, you know, uh, we never really had that direct problem, but, but other circuses did, Ringling Brothers I know did, that, you know, if, if the performance ran over the allotted time, they weren't allowed to keep playing. Well, you never know how long a circus performance. If the lion and tiger or doesn't want to go back into the shoot, it, it may last five minutes longer. Or if, you know, God forbid somebody falls or, you know, there's a number of things that can happen that where circus isn't like a movie. It starts at exact second and ends at exact second. So uh, there were a lot of things that, that, made circuses have to change to the canned music but we try to have the very best canned music we can <laughs> we try to, we we have a, a a gentleman in circus business we're very lucky to be connected with a man who uh composes the music for us oh. and uh so therefore he can take a, a modern piece tweak it and you know make it adaptable for the circus and uh so we're we're lucky to to have him around in these days and a lot of circuses depend on him to write write their music of course some some people uh are pay the and use the original music but i think that i love music and um of course i love music that's done by the wonderful singers and whatever but i think there's something that isn't quite right about hearing Mariah Carey or someone singing the circus. I think it really needs to be adapted to have that circus feel. So that's what we try and do. How has the uh, the performers changed mm -hmm. through the years? Well, I think of all the changes in the circus business, that's probably the the least thing that has changed. Performing is a uh, uh, circus is an art. And I think a lot of times, especially in the United States, in Europe and in South America, uh, circus performers get a lot more respect and have a lot more admiration than they do in the United States. Um, in some places, they're treated like movie stars if they're at the top of their game. And in some of the countries where they, um, it used to be that in, in Russia and, and China, the very best athletes were chosen for the circus school. You know, so I think in, in different parts of the country, maybe circus performers are viewed a little more different. But I tell you, I think that's turning around a little bit because of these shows on television. If you'll notice, uh, what's uh, America has, has, America's has talent. talent. Mm -hmm. The majority, uh, a, a circus act, I don't believe has won it yet. But if you watch that show and you watch the reaction to the circus acts, they get as much applause or in some cases more applause than the singers or the comedians or the dancers. So that's kind of um, uh, neat for me to see that the uh, a true circus act is getting that kind of a, a appreciation. And uh, the, the people that do that show or the people that watch that show might not realize they're watching a pure circus act, but they, you know, they are. So um, performers are, um, are usually multi-generational. They uh, some performers do get into it. There on that particular show, there was a girl who said she fell in love with the man on the flying trapeze, and so she decided she was going to learn this act. And she was marvelous. She uh, she had to have had uh, some gymnastic background. But um, usually, performers are are raised in the circus and are multi-generational. And it's it's a a gift that is passed on from one generation to the other. So I think of all the things that have changed and modernized in the circus world, probably that aspect of it is least changed. When you get ready to plan your next season, mm -hmm. uh, do you already know who do you want? As a performer? As a performer. Mm -hmm. Well, we try to change our performance uh, drastically every couple of years because of a lot of the communities we go back to are repeat uh, every couple of years. So we want to have something new and fresh for the audience. And we may keep the same people, but we may ask them to learn a new routine or to change it in such a manner that it's not, you know, recognizable. And so... Uh, some of our performers have been with us for many years, but they have evolved into different acts so that the public wouldn't realize it's the same person. But we do. I mean, we know now who will be with us next year. But there are always unforeseen things. I, we had a, a young man fall last year, and he was injured 
quite severely. He is recovering and will recover, but it's possible that he won't be ready for the start of the season. So it's kind of just like a football team. You know, you have injuries and or pregnancies or uh, marriage breakups. It's 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 living life on the road in the center ring, but there's still all the problems of living life that go along with it. It's, you know, you're not immune to any of the problems that you would have in Stillwater or wherever you live. I mean, you still have illnesses, preg- um, not pregnancy is a problem, but you know what I'm trying to say. Life goes on even underneath the tent. So uh, we have to adapt for those circumstances. Uh, uh, we had a, a, a accident this year, uh, like the third day out, uh, they had, uh, it was a high wire troop and they were rear ended by a truck through no fault of their own, completely demolished their, their living com- compartment and their rigging for their act. So they had to hurry and scramble and go and try to get it. But we were without them for a little while, but they eventually came back. So you have to, you know, keep adapting to every day what comes up before you. So um, it's uh, probably a little more complicated than the average person would imagine. It's uh, not just a, a circus. It's many different types of of businesses put together. It's a trucking business. It's an animal business. It's entertainment. It's concessions business. We feed our people. We have a truck that all it does is is prepare meals. So they get two full meals a day. Everyone on the circus that wants to go there and eat can go and eat. And uh, then they have coffee and the rolls in the morning before they leave. Say we're in Hugo setting up and we're going to Paris. We would get up at 530. They would have their coffee and rolls. They would get their little route slip that tells them highway 271 and whatever. And uh, they would go to the next town. And then um, at 11.30, they would have lunch, but it would be in the next town. And th- that cookhouse will go prepare a meal and, and be ready to serve it by 11.30. So they'll take a break from whatever they're doing. And then they have the, the night meal. And that's usually the larger meal. A lot of the performers won't eat that meal because it's in the middle of a performance. So they'll get take-home trays, take them home. And then after the show, they'll um, eat the meal. So uh, it's it's many different. It's a costuming company. It's, you know, it's so many things put together. We have uh, someone that handles the log books and we have to do DOT and IFTA. And, you know, you have to get those every day. We purchased $2,000. Last year it was worth of fuel to pump into our generators and our trucks. All that has to be taken care of on a daily basis. We have a mechanical crew that travels along with us. They follow up with the wrecker and the tires and everything. We don't call a local guy to come and fix our tire. We fix our tire ourselves and move on to the next town. So it's uh, it's quite an amazing operation. It really is. It's it's uh, um, it's a big umbrella <laughs> that uh, underneath the, or a big big top. Uh, it takes a lot of different. You know, everyone that travels with the circus is not wearing that spangled costume in the center ring but they're just as important as that performer in the center ring they have their job is just just as valuable uh how do you keep everything straight Ooh, sometimes we don't but it's like i said if you come and see a setup you won't hear anyone hollering instructions or screaming it's very departmentalized mm-hmm. there is a head mechanic there is a head electrician there's a head. We have one man that all he does is secure water all day. We have a trunk with a huge tank on it. Our local host, the rotary or the chamber, whoever arranges for us to have a water source, he goes and fills his tank. He gives delivers water to the animals first, the elephants, the ponies, everything get wa- gets watered. He goes back, he gets another load. He comes and brings it for the, the, the cookhouse, the, the concession department. He goes and fills it, then he fills the the sleepers with water. So that's his job all day is to uh, procure water. So nobody has to tell him. We have a a man called a 24-hour man that goes ahead of us and uh, meets with the local host, looks over the grounds, at least sees where the tent's going to be, finds out where the water is. So he meets that man when he gets to the next lot at at seven or eight in the morning, he leads him to the water source. So he knows where to get his water and that's his job all day. The cooks know that they have to prepare these meals. Uh, We have one person that goes and buys uh, local produce and fresh meat and everything every day. Uh, That 24 hour man 
the day ahead uh, schedules uh, hay to be developed or de delivered hay to be delivered for the animals. Um, it's very organized. It's very there's very it's very departmentalized. Uh, when the tent is going up, there's a big crop top crew. There's a electrical crew. There's a um, uh, we call them butchers. They're they're vendors that sell the popcorn and stuff during the performers, but they help put the tent up too. So uh, they have their job. They have their seats to erect. It's it's very, very organized. And not that things don't go wrong. They do. But uh, we have good bosses. We have good people. Um, uh, and so it that part of it usually, it's usually outside forces that throw wrenches into Mm -hmm. our gears. It's usually Mother Nature or the local health inspector decides that uh, he wants something different than the last hundred towns we've been in. You know, everybody has their own little pet thing. So uh, maybe this day the electrical inspector thinks that we need to bury all the cables instead of just laying a uh, rubber matting over the cables. So you never know what to expect every day, but mostly it's not within, but it's the outside sources that, that usually slow us down. <laughs> when the show's going on, where are you? Mm -hmm. uh, it depends. Hopefully I'm in the office counting money, <laughs> but <laughs> not always. Um, I, um, I still consider myself a jack of all trades. I I will sell tickets. I'll take tickets. I'll direct the people. Uh, my husband will be out there parking cars if needed. Uh, uh, if I see that they need me in the tent, I'll go in there and help seat people. Uh, if the line at the concession stands too long, I'll jump in and make snow cones. Uh, I don't have a... My father watched every performance. He was very famous because he had his folding chair. He would carry it in. He would sit by the back door and he would walk watch every performance. And um, I don't do that uh, for several reasons. One, I'm, a, I'm very critical and I'm very uh, picky. And uh, if I watch it too many times, I start being too critical because I don't see it as the audience sees it. You know, I see it as somebody that's sitting there seeing it every day and, and maybe critiquing something that really doesn't make any difference, if that makes any sense. A lot of people wonder why I don't sit there every day. But honestly, that's the main reason. I, I, I think I get too critical. And uh, uh, if this person's shoes is a different color than this person's shoes in the same act, or, you know, that the, that the public wouldn't. I want it to be good, and I want the acts to be completed properly, and I want the wardrobe to look nice, and I want all of that, and it is. But I feel I just feel that if I watch it every day, every show, that I I might be become overcritical. So I don't watch it. I like it to be, I like to walk in and it to be fresh and it and and I really enjoy watching it. Uh, if that makes any sense. <laughs> so you may watch the first one of the season and the last one. Of the well, season. I watch a few more than that, and I kind of watch at the end of the seat sometimes when they don't even know I'm in there because I want to be sure that what I see when I'm sitting in the front row. It's not something different than the average person that comes to see it would see if I'm not sitting in there. So I kind of surprise them and drift in and out and and uh, don't get in too much of a routine. But I also do a lot of the uh, paperwork. I'm everybody in our family is responsible for different aspects of it, and uh, I I have the unpleasant task of. Uh, uh, in putting the bills. Mm -hmm. So, but that gives me a chance to see who's spending what and uh, whether this guy stopped at a gas station that the, the gas was three ninety eight a gallon and the other guy stopped where it was three sixty eight a gallon. And I'll ask that guy, why didn't you look for the three sixty eight a gallon gas? You know, it gives you a chance to see how, you, how the money's being spent. So that's my job. Um, Tracy, our oldest daughter, is in charge of all the immigration papers. She does all the immigration for the people that come from a variety of countries all over the world to work with us. Uh, she also, she and her husband also are in charge of the concessions, and then her husband is uh, overseas and designs the lighting and is kind of responsible for hiring all the, the acts uh, 
Uh, he comes from a circus family and he has a lot of contacts and so he does that. Our other daughter is in charge of all the uh, animal permits, uh, which is, it's very complicated. Uh, each, uh, sometimes each city, each state has to have different documentation for the animals. And she's also in charge of, uh, she meets with our local host every day, the Kiwanis or Chamber, and she settles up ticket sales and, and that part of it. Our other son-in-law is uh, more in charge of uh, wrecking the big top, and he uh, uh, is he likes animals. He doesn't really work with the animals, but he observes and and checks on them, and and uh, so they all have their own um, expertise and their own jobs, and that way we try not to step on anybody's toes, and <laughs> uh, so it uh, it takes it takes everyone. It's uh, I would hate to be, and there are people that are. Uh, single owners of circuses that don't have family working with them. And to me, it would not be a, a fun thing. I, you know, I, I really enjoy our family being together and working towards one goal. And um, my grandchildren have jobs. My granddaughter rides a little pony in the parade like I used to do when I was five. And uh, my one grandson is our office gopher. He uh, gets change and tickets and changes seats and, you know, runs for us. And then my other grandson, it, kind of interested in performing, but this year he worked in the concessions. He worked one of the windows, waited on the public. They're 10 years old, will be 11 soon. And so they learn uh, at a young age to, to work and have responsibilities. And, you know, I'm not bragging because anything is possible, but we don't have a drug problem or anything like that on our show because, you know, we're, they're busy. They're working. They're occupied. They're. Uh, uh, we have a school that travels uh, along with us, and we have a teacher that uh, is usually a retired teacher and uh, has never been on a circus, but they like to travel. And our one we had last year was wonderful, and we had fifteen students in our school, and they go to school every day. He had four different classes, and they go Monday through Friday all the way through the summer, and then we take them to state parks and national parks and uh, museums and things along the way. So they get exposed to all kinds of things. And uh, we have a young lady that travels with us that was a roommate of my daughter's at uh, TCU. And uh, she graduated and she kind of liked the circus. So we said, come travel with us just for a summer. And she'd never traveled much. And so she did. And that was seven years ago, I think. And she is our office manager, but she really works with the children and they have, uh, she works with them on the weekends. They have little productions they do. They had a beautiful uh, ceremony on, on 911. Uh, we have one young lady that's about 15. She has beautiful singing voice and she sang a couple of, she sang God Bless America, a couple of songs and they recited poetry and uh, it was a wonderful, uh, all the circus people attended. They have we have uh, Easter egg hunts. We had a. We have, uh, you know, we have all kinds of things for the kids during the year, and it, we have a weenie roast at the Fourth of July, and and uh, it's uh, it's great. It really is. It's the big family. Yep, it's kind of like I guess you imagine in the old days in the cities where their blocks had block parties and the blocks kind of had personalities. Well, you know that's and it's it's uh, a true. Mm, melting pot because we have people from all over the world and we seem to live together and function well even though sometimes the language is a problem uh, because there might be five or six different languages spoke on the on the circus grounds but um, and the food tastes aren't always the same but at least once a year we or sometimes more we have potluck where everyone will bring the different foods from their countries and we all share in the big top and and have potluck dinners so that's something fun we do too but it's extremely hard work, and uh, you have to you have to love the circus and w love what you do, or or you couldn't do it. It it, it takes too much out of you, uh, uh, physically, emotionally, uh, to do this day after day if you really didn't love what you're doing. And that goes down to the working man that's driving that stake in the ground, or the guy on the flying trapeze that's completing the triple. You know, they really have to like what they're doing. Do you have a favorite part yourself? Uh, as far as the performance, mm -hmm. uh, the elephants. Yeah, 
Yeah, there are several different acts that I really enjoy, and we had a we have a wonderful flyer, and and he's really a joy to watch. Uh, he's really good. We have a young man that has been here. Uh, he's eighteen now. He came when he was uh, fifteen, fourteen or fifteen, and he's a contortionist. And I love more than watching him. I love the reaction of the audience when he does his act. Uh, I love to see the young performers that really have practice. I've seen them practice in between shows and before and after. And then when they get to debut that act in the ring, I, I really enjoy watching them. But, you know, my, I guess I've inherited that true love for the elephants. I just, they're the most magnificent animals on earth. And, and, um, uh, I just really like being around them, seeing them. Do you have a favorite venue? Uh, yeah. Uh, uh, as far as the ten, uh, the stops. Which favorite, oh, favorite, stops. Favorite yeah, I, historically there have been some that we've developed over the years that that we really look forward to going back to. One of them is uh, Sheboygan, Wisconsin, because we always play right on the lake, and Sheboygan has a circus history. My mother and father, the first circus my mother ever worked for was called Sell Sterling Circus, and it was uh, a family out of. A Sheboygan, Wisconsin, that had that, the Linderman family. And so a lot of them still live there and are retired. And so they always come and see us. And we have brats and we have a polka band. And we always, I guess my favorite venues maybe don't have anything to do with the circus, but rather the location and, and the camaraderie of different places around the country where we set up. Jacksonville, Illinois is one. Um, uh, it just, um, a lot of it depends on the, on the uh, people that are in the community rather, I guess, than the, than the location. But it's always nice to be, uh, sometimes I get to, uh, we're down around Houston, we'll set up on the Gulf and here my, my RV is parked with a perfect view of the Gulf. And I think, wow, you know, it cost me several million dollars to, to have a condo here. And, and so those venues are always nice. Uh, but uh, uh, I like to set up in, in Kansas on the farmland. It just, you know, it all depends on the response of the community and whether you feel like you're wanted and appreciated. Uh, if people come out in the morning and watch the tent go up or uh, maybe they'll bring school buses of children out to see the animals and see the activities, you know, that's what makes you, I know it's it sounds really corny, but that's what makes you feel like what you're doing is worthwhile. When you feel like you're coming into a community that wants you to be there, that that appreciates you, and and that uh, you bring joy and fun into their lives that that maybe they wouldn't have if you hadn't have brought the circus to town that day. And so um, uh, I think that wherever that happens, that's my favorite venue. How do you decide your route every year? Well, we, we cover a lot of the United States uh, out of, you know, there's probably, I can uh, Maine and New Hampshire and Vermont, uh, besides Alaska and Hawaii, I think are the only three states that we uh, have never set up in. And uh, so we try to vary it. We went west last year. This year we'll probably stay in the Midwest, which is my favorite. But uh, then we might go east uh you know, it, it, we vary it from year to year because we we go to smaller communities. We don't, I mean, we play Chicago, we play Fort Worth, we play Dallas, but I'd probably prefer being in Shawnee or Okmulgee or Elk City or, you know, rather than Oklahoma City or Tulsa, just because we like to be the big fish in the pond, not, you know, those cities are inundated with entertainment. They can pick to do something every night of the week if they wanted. But if we pull into Chickasha, uh, you know, it might be a big deal. So um, I forgot what the question was. I got to... Uh, How you decide your route. Yeah. Uh, so Chickasha, we wouldn't go back to every year. We might give it a year to rest. Uh, Tulsa, we might go back to every year. So we will vary the route um, to let it rest and hope that another circus doesn't come in in, in the year we're letting it rest uh, to go back to just so that it'll be fresh. And, and you know, they won't say, well, we just went to the circus last year, which, you know, it might have been two or three years ago. So we, we try to let them rest in between the smaller towns. And how big of a, uh, a lot do you need to set up? In? Uh, well, it's changed during the years. It, it used to be a lot bigger than it is, and I'm amazed – 
that now uh, some of the places my son-in-laws can get this set up, we'll uh, pull into a grounds and I'll look and I'll say, there's no way that we're going to get this on. But it was funny, uh, we, we set up on a mall this year and they had um, trees on it and we actually had a tree sticking right up through the, the tent. They had to lay it out where it laced around this tree and for us to be able to set up on. So it, it has gotten smaller, but you know, we need at least uh, somewhere around 400 by 400 feet, not counting parking. So, uh, but we set up in so many different types of venues. We'll set up in, a, uh, we were down on soccer fields. We were at a golf course, which I don't recommend that because it might rain. Uh, we've been in, you know, Farmer John's pasture where you're stepping over the cow patties. We've been in deserts and we show on uh, military bases. We've been at universities, at uh, uh, parks, you name it. We've set up uh, malls, strip malls. Uh, uh, we've been on just about every kind of land you can imagine. Um, some of them not suited for circus, but somehow we made it work. And you also play indoors some? Some, not very. It's not our forte. Uh, we, we, our favorite thing is if you don't have a tent and you don't have an elephant, you don't have a circus. So, but we do break away from our, our traditional love every once in a while and set up in a building. We, we set up in Tulsa, uh, uh every year at the fairgrounds uh, for American Airlines, bring us in as a Christmas party for their employees. And, uh, we also do a Fort Worth, a uh, 10 day stand and, in the Will Rogers Coliseum for the Shriners. And we did a, a thing in Guthrie out at the, the Gaylord's uh, Horse Pavilion thing they have out there. And so every once in a while we will, but it's not our preference and it's not our love. Well, the, the circus business, it's hard work. Yes. And it's definitely changed through the years. Uh, what are some of your, your current challenges as an owner? Well, getting people to want to spend their scarce dollar for us, uh, for entertainment. You know, people are, and that's the largest challenge we have to overcome currently, uh, is the economy over the last, I think we're kind of like the canary in the mine. I think it kind of hits us and, and we see it coming maybe before the average business. People still have to eat. They still have to wear clothes. They still have to um do whatever, buy food, but they don't have to uh, go to the circus. And so uh, we've we've seen uh, this problem in our economy uh, has really hit us. So that that's our, our big challenge is to get people excited enough before we get to town to think that this is something they want to spend their hard-earned money on. And uh, uh, once we get them there, they love it, and we have wonderful response. We've got a great product, and we're very proud of it. And uh, sometimes, just if I'm down, just to make myself feel better, I'll go stand at the gate as the show's over and take in the compliments of "thank you for coming to town," and it was a great show, and come back, and you know it makes you feel good. But you've got to get them there, and right now, that's that's our our most difficult challenge. How has uh, government regulations impacted mm -hmm. the business? Oh, it, it's impacted it tremendously. Uh, it's because, like I said earlier, it's such a, a business of varied businesses. Mm -hmm. It's not just that if you're a rancher, you have to deal with the USDA or whatever, or if you're you know, uh, a restaurant, you have to deal with the health inspector. Uh, we deal with all those entities. And uh, right now, immigration is very difficult. We do have a, you know, we can bring people in as performers, which is different than bringing in laborers, but we also bring in H2B uh, laborers. And uh, believe me, everyone that works for us is legal and they have visas because we go everywhere in the United States and, and we, we do, we're upright and above board and we don't hire any illegals. Uh, but it gets more difficult each year to bring those workers in because of the climate in the United States now where people think that all these uh, people are coming in and taking our jobs. You know, if we were honest, they're doing jobs that nobody else would want to do. And they're a caliber of people as a whole. I don't want to judge people as groups, but as a whole, the caliber of people that uh, 
that we can hire to do this job from foreign countries are um, a higher caliber person that we could hire from the United States to do the same job. And uh, uh, so any barriers that are put up for us bringing people up legally because of the reaction that everyone's having to the ones that come illegally, it makes it harder on us. Um, you know, just every community is having financial problems now. So therefore, every community is trying to raise money rather than taxing their their constituents. So all these new permits have have blossomed over the last few years, you know, permit for everything you can imagine we have to have. And, and it, where it used to be 25 or $50 for a business license, now it's $500 for a business license. So, uh, you know, it's kind of like a domino effect. The economy affects the local communities, which put on more rules and regulations, which affect the businesses. And basically, you know, we're a business. And so anything that comes along down the pike like that affects us. So, I mean, it's uh, just things like that that have changed um, over the last years. Where do you see the future of the circus in general mm -hmm. uh, going? Do you think we'll always have a circus? Well, I've been asked that before, and I believe there will be. Uh, it may not be in the same form as it is today. Uh, you know, when my parents started, I'm so grateful that my father lived in the time he did because for to be a real circus guy, a real showman in that, in that genre, he lived at the perfect time because when they came to town, you know, they didn't have TV, they had limited radio, uh, this, no internet, of course, or anything like that. This was the entertainment coming to town. They would let school out. I mean, kids would come from all over. It, I have eight millimeter movies of uh, the crowds coming. They had their white gloves on. The gentlemen had their hats, their their white coats and their ties. I mean, this was an event. They would sometimes bring picnic lunches and spread their blankets out and they would be there all day. And uh, that's changed, you know. Uh, we are lucky to get them there for, uh, hopefully we can get them to come in the morning like I talked about, but that doesn't happen every day. And hopefully we can get them to come and spend a couple hours with us for the show. But it used to be an event. So my father lived in the best possible time uh, for to be a circus owner and a and, you know uh, a showman, so I think um, the challenge nowadays is to get the kids away from the computers and the, all that, and to get them to the circus. Because once we get them there, they have a a great time. They enjoy it, and even teenagers who really think it's beyond them, if we can get them there, they have fun. Uh, we had a, a friend of ours that was a retired superintendent of schools, and he traveled with us for, oh, seven or eight years and did marketing and publicity. He also traveled on the show with us. And we set up in a, a town just this fall where his uh, godchild was going to the university, and she's majoring in uh, journalism. So she took that opportunity to come out and do a little story on the circus and talk to me. So I invited her back. I said, get some of your friends. Bring them back tonight. We'll we'll treat you. So I didn't think she would. She showed up at the night show, and she had five or six of her um, college friends that she had just met because the school had just started, and she's a freshman. But she talked them into coming to the circus, and they rode the elephant. They had their face painted. They saw the show. I got thank you letters like you wouldn't believe. They just went on and on. What a wonderful time they had. And I bet if I had told them or talked to them the day before the circus came to town, they would have had no interest at all of going to the circus. But, you know, because she came and had a connection and talked them into coming, and it was free for college kids because I treated them, they had a wonderful time. So, we're, you know, those are the challenges that we face is making the circus relevant in, in today's society. Where do you see the, the future of Carson and Barnes going? Uh-huh. Um, we're holding on. We're holding on. And uh, my children love it. Uh, I don't, you know, I can't plan my grandchildren's lives, and some of them may end up in, in the circus, and if that's what they want, 
but we would never push them towards it. All of my grandchildren will go to college, whether they want to or not. And uh, uh, then they can make that choice of whether they want to continue or whether they want to go in a different a field. And, you know, I can't predict what that will be. They're only 10, 7, 5, and 1 week old. So uh, I have five, three, four boys and a girl. But if that's what they want to do, then hopefully Carson and Barnes will still be there for them to want to continue on with. And um, my husband and I and our daughters and our son-in-laws are, are doing the very best we can to uh, see that that happens. But it's very challenging, very challenging. Mm -hmm. Well, you could call any place home. Yeah, here you are in Hugo, yes, Oklahoma. Yes, Hugo, Oklahoma. You've seen all parts of the U.S. <laughs> Why do you decide to continue to call Hugo, Hugo your home? Well, um, this is our home. I mean, uh, this is where we feel comfortable. Uh, we love Oklahoma. We feel we're good ambassadors for the state of Oklahoma and for Choctaw County and Hugo because in every performance, in every town we're in, our elephants are introduced as being either from the Endangered Art Foundation or the Carson Ranch in Hugo, Oklahoma. So uh, everywhere we go, people know we're from Oklahoma and we're proud to be from here. And um, we feel welcome here. We feel uh, part of the community. Uh, David Rawls, uh, you know, was our partner for many years. I've seen his, he had seven brothers and sisters. I've seen them grow from children into adults. And, and he is the only one that really has stayed in the business, but he's been our mayor. He's been our city manager. I mean, Hugo is an integral part of Hugo. And I'll have to be honest with you one time back in the, let's see, I was in high school. It was in the sixties. My father bought property on the Gulf Coast in between Biloxi and Gulfport. And he had every intention of moving the winter quarters to there and trying to make it a year-round business because it's very hard to come to travel. Expenses are so much. It's very difficult to come home with enough money to see everybody through the four, four and a half months. I mean, you know, hay is now $80 a round bale. We've paid as much as a couple of years ago, we paid $120 a round bale for the hay. And, you know, uh, if it a cold winter like last year, the, the elephant barns are heated by natural gas. We spent $1,700 a month on one barn. You know, it's $100 a day just to open one of those shops, just to keep it heated during the winter. And, and it was very appealing, the thought of going to the Gulf Coast and uh, uh, having a permanent park there that would continue to, to stay open during the summer while we were gone. And then we would be able to have tourists and people come in the, in the winter times and it, it would be a continual revenue. And so he did very seriously consider, uh, and he did take some stuff down there. We didn't physically go. We stayed in our home. I was, you know, in school and they didn't um, want to um, uh, unroot me, uproot me and take me to a different place. And so uh, we had people down there, but it didn't pan out. I'm glad it didn't, but it didn't pan out. And I think half the property is probably washed off by hurricanes by now. But uh, it was a good idea, and I could see why he thought of it. But uh, uh, we didn't move, and I'm glad. And I, I unfortunately lost my purse. And why I was carrying my, this in my purse, I have no idea. But I had a really, back when telegrams uh, were still a way to communicate long distance. The the city of Hugo actually sent us a telegram and, and telling us how important we were to the community and, and that they really wished that we would not leave. And, you know, that means a lot to you. So we're here and we're glad we're here. And, you know, Hugo's evolved just like the circus business evolved, some for the better, some for the worse, but it's home. As we get ready to uh, close out our interview. Any wisdom or lessons that your parents passed down to you mm -hmm. that just really resonate with you today? Well, they were uh, hardworking people and they loved what they did. And I think that that is a, a very important lesson for young people to learn that um, um, there are things of value that you may not even realize 
that you're learning as you're growing up with your parents. And I think, you know, they instilled in me uh, the love of the circus and and hard work and taking care of your, trying to take care of your employees and making it, you know, feel like a family. And because you end up, when you're the owner of a circus, you end up being their, you know, their banker, their their minister, their psychologist, their, you become everything to them. So it is like a big family. And I think they instilled that feeling in me as an adult and or a child. And I hope I've continued to do that to, to the people that we work with today. But they were just good people. And they tried to give uh, people uh, good value for their dollar. And they appreciated that people worked hard to earn that money to come to the circus. And they didn't want anybody leaving with uh, without having a good time and without feeling that they we can't we don't please everyone you can't please everyone but I'd say we we give it the best try we can you know and I see that in my girls too uh, you know if a little kid trips and spills his snow cone they go get his cone and they put another snow cone in it they don't wait and let their mama buy another one or if the little kid's balloon burst then you go get them another balloon they you know. As far as the circus world, that's that's uh, what they instilled in me and what uh, they instilled in my children, and, and I've tried to instill in my children, that what we do is it's it's good and it's worthwhile. And uh, it's not out just for the money. and to, to I mean, we do have to make money. It's how we make our living, but we're not out to... Uh, uh, it's not about the money. It's about the tradition of the circus and putting on a quality show and and giving people a, a, a good bang for their buck. <laughs> I don't know if that's what you had in mind, but that's what came to my mind when you asked that question. Well, do you have anything else you'd like to add that we may not have asked you about today? Well, I have stories about my family and my upbringing. Everyone says, you know, you should write a book, and I don't know whether it'd have to be under fiction or <laughs> or fact, because uh, there are so many things that... that have happened to us and to them, you know, their stories seem to be more fascinating to me than, than mine do to me because they, mine seem normal, you know, but, um, they have stories. My father bought a ship one time and took a, he had a vision of going up the coast and, and performing in different towns and, and being in a ship. And, and so my mother and I were there and, and we brought a ship and we, we had a little airplane. We flew up to Nova Scotia and waited for the ship to come from Florida and it kept breaking down. They finally got there and we had our show and, the, you know, the ship catches on fire and it sinks and we have to get the animals off. It's just like a, you know, a movie. And, and there's just so many stories like that. When, when they moved to Mena, Arkansas, they, they didn't have anything. And uh, my mom and dad used to get 25 cents a week for, that's what they got to spend. Everything went back to the circus. So my mother would buy a candy bar. My father would buy a cigar. And they built this house out of uh, green lumber. And they left. And when they came back, it had all shriveled up. And so they had to pack dirt and rags into the, uh, into the, I mean, there's just stories. It's, it could, I could go on forever. My when they'd been in show business 50 years, my, my, uh, we bought my parents a, a beautiful, nice motor home. And, um, so they stood up and they were saying how grateful they were and everything. So my mother stood up and she says, uh, this, it's beautiful. Thank you all. You know, she said, I, when your father and I got married, she was talking to me, we didn't have a pot to pee in. And she said, here, 50 years later, I've got one that holds 35 gallons. <laughs> and, you know, that was her sense of humor. There's just, oh, I can't even, the stories would be, we'd be here for days. So we can wrap it up with that, I guess. <laughs> well, I think your family is, when we look back on circus history, uh, you know, your family, not only in Oklahoma, but it's just something that, you know, will always be remembered. I hope so. I hope so. I, I hope we've been a, a asset to circus business. I hope we've had a positive influence on the circus world. And I believe we have. I, well, I'm very, very proud that this was our, we just completed our 75th tour, uh, 75 years of, of doing this all over the United States. And that actually um, 
you know, there's never been a family in the United States that has continuously owned a circus for that length of time, for 75 years. And, uh, you know, they've done it in Europe a lot. Uh, but here in the United States, I mean, Ringling Brothers has been in business longer than we have, but they've been owned by, you know, a variety of entities, Mattel Toy Company, Ringling Brothers, the Feld family. So uh, I'm very proud of the fact that we've, we've been doing this continually for 75 years. Well, we, we appreciate... Uh you talking with us mm -hmm. and spending some time with us and giving us just a little glimpse into <laughs> to your life uh, as a circus owner mm -hmm. and uh, the contributions your family has made. Thank you so much. Well, you're quite welcome.